Hey guys, so we're looking at chapter five for applied year one, which is on probability. And the best thing about this is this is mostly stuff from GCSE. There's just some new things down here about mutually exclusive and independent events. So we're going to cover some basic probability. We're going to do some stuff on Venn diagrams. We're going to do mutually exclusive and independent. And we're going to do some recapping on some tree diagrams as well. So let's get started with some probability concepts. So I've got here that an experiment is a repeatable process that gives rise to a number of outcomes. So an experiment could be rolling a dice. Equally, an experiment could be going outside and seeing if it's raining. It doesn't have to be something that feels like it's traditionally like rolling a dice or spinning a spinner. It can be other kinds of things that we can measure as well. But obviously the outcomes when you're rolling a dice could be but the numbers on the dice, the outcome if you go outside and see if it's raining could be yes it is raining or no it is not raining. And then an event is a set of one or more of these outcomes. So although the outcomes on this dice are one, two, three, four, five and six, you could have an event like these ones down here. The event could be rolling an even number which means that it could be if the dice lands on two, four, or six. And I've written here that we often use capital letters to represent these events. So what I've got here is that E is the event of rolling an even number on a six-sided dice, and P is the event of rolling a prime number on a regular six-sided dice. Now the sample space is the set of all possible outcomes, and this is the sample space that I've drawn here for it. And I've drawn two of these subsets, which are E and P, to represent these events. So I've said here, because we are dealing with sets, we can use a Venn diagram where the numbers are the individual outcomes. So these are the actual outcomes that you would get on the dice. The sample space is a rectangle, which is why it has this letter S for sample space, and it represents all of the possible outcomes. The events are these sets that we have here. And each of these sets are a subset of the sample space. Subset just meaning like a smaller set of numbers there. And I've said that you do not need to use set, not set notation like the and, which is intersection, and u, which is union, until year two. But I'm going to be mentioning it throughout this topic. So for this one that we've got here, clearly you can see that two is the only number which is inside both of these events, because it is the only number which is both even and prime. You'll then see that inside the prime section, you've got five and three because those are the other prime numbers, but they are not even. And inside the even but not prime, you've got the four and six because they are obviously even numbers, but not prime. And hopefully you can spot that one is obviously neither even nor prime. So the other way you might usually see this Venn diagram, I've deliberately had this one in a kind of a funny sort of shape with these weird loops, is you probably are going to see the Venn diagram standardly in like this kind of shape where you still have your rectangle for the outside, but we usually see it as two loops like this, where we would have the even numbers and the prime numbers. And again, the one that overlaps is two, you'd have the four and the six over here, you'd have the three and the five for the primes, and you'd have the one on the outside. So this is an example of how you can use a sample space to represent all of the possible outcomes. Um, so let's have a look at a slightly different kind of question here. This time it says that two fair spinners each have four sectors numbered one to four. If they're fair, that must mean there's an equal chance of it being those numbers. The two spinners are spun together and the sum of the numbers indicated on each spinner is recorded. Find the probability of the spinners indicating a sum of exactly five or more than five. So what I've written down here is that if the sample space is the amalgamation, so like a mixture of two underlying experiments, these two experiments of spinning spinner one and spinner two, a table is a helpful way to list all of the possible outcomes that we could have. So we're talking about these being summed together, being added. So one add one, you would get two, Two add one is three, four, five, etc. So here we're going to then have three, four, five, six, four, five, six, seven, five, six, seven, and eight. And then the question says, what is the probability that the spinners indicate a sum of exactly five? Well, exactly five, there are four of them. There are four outcomes that will give you exactly five. And in total, there are 16 different outcomes from this experiment. So you get four out of 16, which, of course, we can simplify to a quarter. Then the next part says, how many are more than five? 
Well, you can clearly see I've got one, two, three, four, five, six of them where the score is more than five. So the probability would be six out of 16, which is three out of eight. So in this case, they did it with the sum. I think in the exercise, they do some with the, they do a question with the product, which means you just multiply the two numbers together there. So pretty straightforward to that. Draw a sample space to help you work out how many outcomes there are and consider how many outcomes will satisfy the bits that we're being asked about in the question. OK, so we're going to do another one that is kind of similar, but got a little bit of a twist on it as well. This one says the table shows the times taken in minutes for a group of students to complete a number puzzle. I don't know, maybe something like a Sudoku or something like that. So you can see six of them did it between five and seven minutes, 13 of them did it between seven and nine, all sorts of stuff like that. And it says that a student is chosen at random. I guess it really should say that a, um, a student group is chosen at random because we're picking groups of students here. These are all groups of students we're referring to in the frequency table. Find the probability for a group of students to complete a number puzzle in under nine minutes. Well, actually, if it's under nine minutes, I've realized I've actually phrased that slightly wrong. It should just say less than nine minutes because it says it's under nine minutes. Well, all we need to do for it being under nine minutes is we just look at how much people, how many groups in the table were less than nine minutes. Well, these six people did it in less than nine minutes and these 13 people did it in less than nine minutes. So that is six plus 13 out of however many groups there are in total. So when I add all of these together, I've got six plus 13 plus 12 plus five plus four, which is 40. So there are 40 people in total. So the probability I get here is 19 out of 40. And that's going to be preferable to have that as a fraction because, well, I guess we could have it as a decimal. We could do either 0.475 or 19 out of 40. Either of those would be good. This is where things get a little bit more interesting. It says in over 10.5 minutes in over 10.5 minutes. Well, clearly these five people and these four people, these five groups and four groups, sorry, they took more than 10.5 minutes because their groups up here are more than 11 minutes and more than 13 minutes. But we think that some people inside this group probably did it in over 10.5 minutes. Now we don't know. So we're going to have to estimate how these people were distributed. And I've written that here. We're going to be doing an estimate because we're going to assume that the people are equally distributed across this interval that we've got here. So I'm just going to draw a bit of a diagram to represent what might be happening. So from nine minutes to 11 minutes, we think that there are 12 people distributed across this whole group that we've got here. And we want to know how many of them were 10.5 or above. Well, if the halfway point is 10, then 10.5 is three quarters of the way along, which means that I imagine if it is equally distributed, there is three inside each of those little subgroups. We would imagine if it was equally distributed that there are three people between 9 and 9.5, three people between 9.5 and 10, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that three of them in this group are going to be between 10.5 and 11. So it's a bit like linear interpolation for that kind of question. And you're just going to be thinking about the proportions of them. So when I have this together, we've got three from that group from our estimate plus five plus four. And that's still going to be out of 40. So that is five plus four. That's nine, 10, 11, 12 out of 40. And let's get that one as a decimal as well. 12 out of 40 is 0.3. So we have 0.3 is that probability. Just want to stress this is an estimate because we're assuming that the people are equally distributed across this interval. But it's very possible that these 12 groups, they may have all done it in nine minutes and 10 seconds. We don't know. So we're just making an assumption that they are equally distributed. So it's a pretty easy um, first exercise that we've got here. That's exercise 5A. Have a go at exercise 5A and um, we're going to move on to the next exercise in just a second.